Good morning, this is Angela with Park Rose Permaculture. Welcome back to the final part of my 2020 food forest tour. If this is the first video that you're watching in this tour, please check out the whole playlist right here. So we're gonna talk about this section of the garden and please understand that there are plants in here I have done some major rehab pruning or pruning for shape in. So it looks a little different than it does most years, uh, but that's okay. Sometimes gardens have to go through that process or plants in a garden have to go through that process where um, they need a big haircut in order to kind of regenerate them and give them a second chance at life, right? So um, return them to peak productivity. So starting here, we have just left the last section of the chicken run here and we're underneath the hazel guild um the filbert and a black currant and we're next to my woodshed which i was supposed to build one summer and then i broke my leg and so my husband built it for me out of pallets um and scrounged lumber we get all of our wood free off of craigslist um or by word of mouth and um, or by the side of the road because we have a yodel wood stove and um, I split all of the wood myself. It's one of my favorite hobbies. You can see I have a video here about um, my favorite ax. So over the shed, in the back you can see coming through and growing over my neighbor's fence, I have a five leaf akebia, akebia quinata. It has beautiful flowers early in the year, and Akebias technically are supposed to set fruit. I haven't gotten any fruit off of this yet, but Akebia is a great vine for shade or sun. In my climate, in 8B, it can get powdery mildew, particularly in the fall. This year I'm having some powdery mildew issues now because we've had a very, very wet spring just give it a rinse or a little spray with some soapy water and that helps. I found the powdery mildew hasn't severely impacted it before. Also growing up and over in the back of the shed, I have my hardy kiwis. So that's a actinidia. They are not fuzzy kiwis. I'm not going to get all the way back in there because I don't want to damage the plants in between right now. Um, my goal with my hardy kiwis last year was the first year I got fruit off of them and my goal with them you can see they have climbed up into the hazel accidentally I don't actually want them to be using the tree as a trellis because that fruit will be impossible to reach I am training them up and over the front of my shed so this is the female and if we walk over here this is the male. You do need a male and a female to get fruit. Kiwis are very vigorous growers and they need to be pruned three times a year. So I did the June pruning and I will be doing pruning again in August and then they will get pruned over the winter for air circulation and um, to set um, the appropriate number of flower buds. If you wanna grow actinidia kiwis, I think hardy kiwis, this uh, variety is Dumbarton Oaks. I got it at One Green World. They have an excellent selection and Dumbarton Oaks is my favorite. Um, they're a really lovely looking plant, but boy oh boy are they vigorous. You need a very strong structure to grow them over because the vine can weigh 100 pounds and then the female can have another 100 pounds of fruit on top of that. So we're not talking about a little dinky garden trellis. We're talking, think of something you would grow a wisteria on. That's what you want to grow a kiwi on. Okay, um, next to it. This is my favorite plum tree and it has gotten a number of June sprouts so it really needs some pruning. This is, if I know I talk about growing for ease of growth and productivity and in permaculture we look for things where um, the permaculture principle of obtaining yield can be realized. Well, a yield means something different to different people. So I'm gonna climb back in here. Back, there's lovage in here and white currants and um, 
hardy geraniums. So we are in the middle of this plum tree and it has not sat very many plums. So when we look at the permaculture principle of obtain a yield, this plum tree probably has 20 plums set on it this year. And I am ecstatic at the idea of having 20 plums on this kind of gnarly looking plum tree. And that's because this is a variety called Bavay's Green Gage. And I think it is the best plum there is in existence. So it's not your average Green Gage. Don't get it confused. There's a lot of plums sold as Green Gages. They're a great kind of green plum. Um, good for making melomel, which is a, like a fruited mead. Bavay's Green Gage, if you have a true Bavay. Um, it is not a plum that is ever going to be commercially viable. It's small and it is greenish with kind of an ugly mottly brown blush to it. It's not a pretty plum, but the taste is, I think it is the finest plum there is. I think it is the finest dessert fruit there is. It's exquisite and it doesn't set heavily. So I do try and grow things for productivity, but I also want flavor and I want flavor and I want uniqueness and I want characteristics for, for which I can't get um, from commercially available fruit. There is nothing like a Beauvais Green Gage Plum. Um, again, get the real thing from One Green World. I looked for several years before I found a supplier who had one. Um, for me, well worth it. It bears very lightly and the plums aren't pretty, but the flavor is exquisite. And this is again why we talk about growing these old heirloom varieties and how much is lost when we industrialize agriculture and when we produce things for shipability and not for flavor. Okay, so I don't have a garage, so um, my wood shop workspace is back here under my pergola. This is an aronia berry. Underneath it, I have a rhubarb that's very happy and there are hardy geraniums and fringe cup as well. Now this is my nursery where I start a lot of, of my small plants uh, because it's shady, it faces north and it's an area right at the back door where I remember to water. So if I'm rooting cuttings in the ground, I do them between the aronia berry and the rhubarb. It's a great spot. Next. This is my Shisandra chinensis, which I was very excited about growing. It is six years old. This is the self-fertile kind. It's growing in mostly full shade, but if there's any sun, we had a few hot days. Boy, it gets sunburn at the drop of a hat. And also I had thought by now it would be way up and covering my pergola because I'd read about Shisandra doing that. And it's just very slow growing for me. And I'm not sure how much, I'm not sure how to give it any more shade than I've already given it. Um, and it, it's really struggling. So if you have tips on growing Shisandra chinensis, let me know. It's also called um, Five Flavor Berry. So someday, hopefully I will get berries off of it. It set berries this year and then dropped all of them. Okay. So here we're getting ready to enter. We are leaving this Bavay's Green Gage Plum Guild. And here is my contorted mulberry which is one of my favorite trees for its sculptural quality. The fruit off of it is small and um, it's ripe earlier, uh, but it's nothing to write home about. I think that the Illinois Everbearing Mulberry has much better fruit. This is just such a wonderful architectural plant. And for me, if we think about permaculture usages, it's a great, great mulch plant. So you can see it likes to set these very vertical shoots this tree would get very big if I let it. And so I uh, prune it frequently four or five times a year. And I use that for chop and drop mulch. Okay, so moving on from the contorted mulberry, uh, we are getting ready to step into the shade garden. And I really love the concept of garden rooms. And I love using plants as a screen or a curtain or an arch or a doorway from one section of the garden to another. So we're getting ready to go through this archway of the um, contorted mulberry and into 
what is my shade garden. And now remember, I have cut some things back pretty radically in here, so it is not as shady as it is, as it is most years. Okay, I'm gonna come back in here, underneath. And now we're standing in the entrance to the shade garden. Once again, using a gate made out of pallets and uh, hogwire so that what light there is can get through. Over the gate, I have a three-leaf akebia, akebia trifoliata, which is less prone to powdery mildew in my experience than akebia quinata. This has pretty very pale pink flowers, whereas the akebia quinata has deep um, purpley red flowers, purpley like burgundy kind of flowers. On this side, I have a sausage vine, which has yet to flower. It is new, I put it in two years ago. I'm not sure yet what it's gonna look like. Now, sausage vines may not be hardy in your area. I am an 8B and I'm at the edge of their hardiness, but they're quite pretty. Okay, stepping into this garden. So this garden was a big problem when we first started. Um, to my left, we have my black caps. which are in peak production right now. I'm picking tons and tons and tons of black caps every day. On the ground, I grow lots of ferns, a huge variety of ferns. And um, of the native, um, some of the native oxalis and the native dicentra. Those are some of my go-to ground covers in, in a shaded area. And move through, we have the lovely thimbleberry. I have a video on thimbleberries here. And um, they have these beautiful leaves with this velvety texture. I love growing them along a path because they make a great s rustling sound when you walk through them. As we step through, at this time of year, the thimbleberries tend to lean over into the path and that's okay. They're not thorny at all, unlike other raspberries. So then we move into my elderberry, and this is where I've done some big rehabbing. So these normally are much taller, and I'm actually gonna step through here and turn around and show you. And this area is much shadier. And um, like I said, elderberries are um, a shrub. And like many shrubs, once every several years, uh, their fruit production starts to wane. And so once every several years, I take them back very heavily and that kind of resets them. So this year I'm not gonna be getting fruit off of them because I have taken them back really hard. So I have a affinity for elderberries. I love making elderberry syrup and um, elderberry wine and elderberry jelly. I really like them. I love making elderflower cordial. So here's the thing though about elderberries for me. I have um, a blue elder in the back which got cane borer and I've cut it to the ground and I'm trying to, and I disposed of all of the material and seeing if it will live. And then I have these two black elders. I think the flavor of the blue elder is better. The tree is much bigger though. But even so these black European elders, they tell you that they get 12, 10, 12 feet in the catalog. That's not been my experience. Maybe they are exceptionally happy here. They get huge, 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 huge. I mean, we're talking huge canes and they arch over and they tend to cover this whole area loaded with fruit. Now, some of the problems with black elderberry is they can get black aphids on them, but I found it's not impacted fruit production. They are a host for black aphids though. So. Underneath them, I try and grow a lot of native ground cover. This garden had loads and loads of natives, and it still does, but I have included a lot of non-natives as well. I have a, a number of hostas, which I've gotten uh, from my mother. Uh, hostas are edible, by the way. I don't eat them, but you can. Moving along, I have a white currant, which as I talked about in my video yesterday, has blister aphid on it right now. So this area, again, 
it is normally a lot shadier. So some of my plants are struggling a little bit right now because they are experiencing more sunshine this summer than they're used to. If we move over to this corner, this is my last of my pawpaws, of my improved Peterson pawpaws, and I have a video here. If you have seen my other pawpaws, you'll notice this one is a little bit leggier and smaller. And when you grow pawpaws in a shadier location, which they like, they get a little more, um, with, they're a little more wispy, but they can tolerate that, that quite well. In fact, they enjoy that, um, that shade. Now this is starting to get big enough that it is reaching into the sun more. I have this right outside my bedroom window and I also have it here because it's where my dryer vents out and that creates a really warm microclimate that not everything has enjoyed, but the pawpaw likes it. I have, um, underneath all kinds of ground cover. And these are the seed pods of the native fringe cup, which is just finishing blooming. And that is a great ground cover. It is a native coral bell. I also have ladies mantle. I have the native coastal strawberry. Uh, I have astelbees, fever few. Here you can see there's an Angelica. I let Angelica freely self sow around the garden. I have a video on Angelica you can check out. So I'm really enjoying collecting shade loving, low ground covery kinds of plants and getting them established. I think they are often um, underappreciated in a garden, those small border edging kind of plants. I do have quite a few other food producers besides the elderberries and the pawpaws in here. I have the native salal. Let's go take a look at that. Um, there is the white currant and next to it I have a young aronia berry. And then I grow a lot of salal. Salal is a native, Galtheria shallon. And it lives, it loves cool coastal areas. It loves coniferous forest, damp forest. And it produces a blackberry that is not sweet. It's good for using uh, cooked cooking with uh, like meats in a stew and it's good for making a dried leather. Now when you, if you grow um, salal, it gets these spots on it and that's just really normal. If you go find them in the wild, the older leaves look like this and the newer leaves look like this. It has a flower that looks a little bit like a blueberry. It is, it is related to a blueberry distantly. So that's Salal, and it will creep and spread slowly by runners. I try and encourage it to spread. I think that it's a really cool, low-growing native, good ground cover worth having. So I'm always looking for things to cover my neighbor's fence on my side, and so I have a climbing bleeding heart here, which is was in the genus Dicentra and they moved it and I'm forgetting the name of the new genus they've put it in. It'll come to me. Underneath I have more Cranesbill geraniums and I also have a couple other natives. I have a red huckleberry and boy oh boy are red huckleberries slow to get going and slow to get producing and they are tricky to grow in the home garden. I've had several die and next to it I also have a snowberry. This is a snowberry here. It has these floppy leaves. You can see this is a whole tangle, which I really love. I have a little polyculture here. I love the look of the yellow dicentra flowers and the purple cranesbill geranium all tangled in with the snowberry. And next to it is also a meadow rue, Thalictrum. So let's look back down across the shade garden here. My bear's breech is very happy here in blooming. So this garden doesn't contain as many edible plants as some of the other spaces in my yard, and that's okay. I really enjoy having a space for non-edible natives. I enjoy having a space for um, some other shade-loving plants back here that can support the primary core species at the center of the elderberry guilds and the pawpaw guilds here. 
this swath here is so narrow I really struggle with what to grow over it so and in it so if you have a suggestion for something to go up over the fence here I would love to hear it and imagine most years these elderberries arcing up and over and providing a significant amount more shade this area also so this I said was a problem area very low lying here and we have a dry well over here to deal with runoff from the roof and stuff and um this part of the garden because it rains so much in oregon is was a soggy muddy mess you would come in here and you, your boot would just sink in and the water would rise up around it it was just boggy and muddy and gross and what um we've done is build up with a lot of mulch and then to use that as a sponge to absorb the water and then planted it with all these plants and they also use the water the elderberries do a fantastic job of sucking up and using that water and so for us that's really remedied the issue of it being really soggy sodden back here and we don't have that problem anymore so that's sort of a look at the last portion of my garden the shade garden again here's the native oxalis which makes a great ground cover and from here we would go back out into the front yard my lady banks rose it's not time to prune her yet it will be soon so she's very um very happy right now and reaching for the sun and the clematis growing up over it and my hops as well so we enter from here back into the front of the yard where we started so I hope you enjoyed this 2020 food forest garden tour. I know I really enjoyed being able to share it with all of you. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. I will be back later in the week with lots more about permaculture. Enjoy your weekend.